Hi, we're here with Alex Ross Perry and Jason Schwartzman, whose film Listen Up Philip premiered here at the Sundance Film Festival this week. Thanks for talking to the playlist. Thank you for talking to us. Can you really look at the lens or you? You can look at me. Okay. That's fine. Um, congratulations, the movie's fantastic. It, Thank you. Everyone's talking about it and I'm saying Jason's never been better. I don't know if that's, I don't mean that to be an insult. It's uh, like, you're, it's your, it's your, you're just great in the movie. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, people that's are freaking out. Yeah, they are. Okay. Um, how did the two of you meet? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I didn't meet Jason until, until we wrapped the movie. What do you he mean? He came to New York and uh, he was Philip. Really? Yeah. He, he, you know, he'd never done method acting before. <laughs> but to spend eight <laughs> weeks in character was new for you. Yeah. I changed my email address and everything. Did you really? Well, he got rid of oh. it because Philip lives in the world without computers, mm -hmm. so he didn't have any. He got rid of it. Unreachable. Mm -hmm. That was unreachable. It was pretty intense because, you know, I would have questions for Jason, like, you know, like, you know, just, well, what, what's it like to be Jason's man? He's like, Jason's not here. Yeah. Um, That's eight weeks of misanthropy. Mis uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I didn't, uh, I, I only just met Alex, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, he's great. Um, actually, that's not true. We met briefly before the movie it's started. True. We had dinner together and we got along. Then I met him after the movie, and um, <laughs> he seemed like it was you know seemed like it went well. And it's funny, but I saw you right before and after. It was like perfectly bookended. Yeah, because uh, that entire period in the middle was just Philip. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was on vacation. <laughs> no, we uh, you know, but the, the script was enough to get you to the dinner. Yes. And to agree to, to do the movie. Yes. All right, let's talk about that. So, Alex, where did this all come Sorry, from? I'll no, that's inside. fine. <laughs> that's fine. Um, it's like you just spewed every kind of misanthropic, anxious, self-loathing thought you've ever had into into Philip. Oh, I assure you, I've had plenty more. Okay. I'm a little worried about about your outlook on life right now, but it's not it's not that so much <laughs> as I would you know put things in the script as either wish fulfillment, like oh man, mm -hmm. one day I'm gonna get this is exactly how I'm gonna give it to someone when I get to this point. Or I put things in the script where I was like, man, this is, I feel this tendency growing in me. I need to write this down and make these characters do it so that I don't make myself do it. Huh. Um, you know, I think there's something cathartic about that. And if there's comedy in the film, I think it comes from the fact that people most likely see these things happening. They relate to them. They're like, you know, I felt that way before. I've never said those things because I'm a civilized person who lives in this world, mm -hmm. but watching this guy unload all these thoughts that we all want to say mm -hmm. is quite amusing to me. Now I can laugh because I feel safe because this is a problem that we all have. I think that's where so much the laughter came from in the, I mean, the audience for sure. That's what oh, good. you just, yeah, recognize all these things. No, I definitely felt that like in the opening scene, for instance, when he's yeah. kind of unloading on his ex-girlfriend Mona, I remember thinking while we were shooting it, um, Wow, I'm really not letting her talk. And uh, I know, you know, oftentimes like a discussion like that does have a sort of back and forth. But this is really just to kind of push this person on the ground and don't let them get up. Um, and, it, it, and it was odd to do that because I, I mean, obviously I've argued with people and but when you do there is a sort of, right? Yeah, I mean, back and forth you a know, little bit. And so this just felt like a, not getting Not getting a word in edgewise. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. do you think that's what sets Philip off? For the, what do you think he's like before we see before we see him do that? If I had an idea on that, there'd be another scene at the beginning of the movie. Okay. I don't know. I mean, he's probably a simmering cauldron of rage ready to boil over. Mm -hmm. And I think we start his story at exactly the minute where that cauldron starts to, uh, starts mm -hmm. to boil. Because, you know, we talked about <clears throat> Philip as being... Like, a, you know, when you look at this movie, like something, uh, say, Scarface, where that very first scene, Philip gets his first taste of this illicit material. Mm -hmm. By the end of the movie, he's just drugged out of his mind and completely overwhelmed by this thing that he shouldn't have tried in the first place. Hmm. He lets the demons in. He decides to be this kind of a guy. And he's just like, I'm just gonna try this. I'm just gonna try being this kind of a guy. Mm -hmm. And then he's just like, this is the best feeling in the world. I could go all night. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. And at the end of the movie, it's like, wow, see, that's what happens when you do drugs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when, um, when by the end of the movie, it's, it's almost, it's his natural instinct. Mm -hmm. You know, in the beginning, it's just something he's sort of toying with, and I think in the end, it becomes his his reflex. Yeah, habit. Yeah. What did you think when you first read the script? Did it come to you fully formed, or was did you come on board board earlier when? Did the script come to me? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got the script. Okay. And, uh, yeah, it was an amazing like 
experience reading it because I remember reading like 30 pages and feeling like this is very like this is a miserable person this character and extreme an extreme point mm -hmm. and an extreme low and uh, I kind of put it down for a second I was like yeah, I feel I feel strange I can't believe he said that to that person and I played with my daughter for a second I was like I just I gotta take a second to do and then like 20 minutes later going What's going on over there with that guy? You know, I just, uh -huh. and it just—it's like it just pulls you. It's—it's it's very like um, it was such a great script to read, and it, also I like you know there's we we get to spend uh, time with each. Hey, Hello. how are you? Oh, what's the pause, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> um, no, but um, you get to spend like time with these characters with uh, my ex-girlfriend played by Elizabeth Moss and. Ike Zimmerman, who's... Oh, girlfriend. Yeah. yeah, girlfriend. Yeah, I say girlfriend too, sorry. Um, and, uh, and Jonathan Price, Ike Zimmerman. And uh, you were saying that you timed it, and each person gets about roughly 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, it, without even doing it on purpose. I mean, the script was different. Back and timed it. Scenes got cut out, and scenes got reordered, but from the minute where I consider that Ashley Elizabeth Moss becomes the protagonist of the movie, mm -hmm. to the minute that... I think that Ike Zimmerman becomes the protagonist of the movie, and then from there to where Philip becomes the protagonist. Her segment and his segment are 20 minutes and 40 seconds and 20 minutes and 45 seconds. Wow. Each and that point. wasn't planned, that just I mean, kind of... It was, I mean, the script, I'm sure, it was roughly equal, but that is right. pretty mathematically sound. And, you know, there's a scene at the beginning and end with Philip in it, so it's confusing who that is, but in my mind, they're very equal, and I think there's something yeah. really challenging in that that I wanted to try to... Hopefully, people feel like it's but, an interesting way to do a film. But, and it, well, I mean, but that's what when I read the script, that's like, I was, it was, it was interesting to read that a script in that style because you really felt you like skip anything, over huge parts of it. Yeah, <laughs> took me thirty minutes to read the script. No, it just it really felt like anything could happen, and mm -hmm. that was uh, really it was so great to read. And then, you know, when I met Alex. I just knew instantly that we were gonna get along and go make a, a fun. Go have a fun time making a movie. Is that how you pick your movies? Do you think about the director, the script? I mean, yeah. Every, is it, those are the two key, I'm assuming. Yeah, a lot of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you can't, I guess you don't always have the luxury to spend a lot of time with the director and the writer, but I mean, I think to me, like all the time you can spend with someone is like the most important thing. And so, like, when I met Alex, I was so excited because I was like, I can't wait to come to New York early and spend time with this person and go see movies with this person and mm -hmm. go on walks with this person and make this movie with this person and mm -hmm. yeah it had a lot to do with why I did them. I mean I, I yeah absolutely big a lot of it. Um, so how did you unlock the character? Was there anything you had to, to do for that or was it I mean you're an actor you act but <laughs> <laughs> was it I unlock the character well um, you thought about Marvel right? Huh? You say you basically well, my, yeah. My behavior. Well, there was like, yeah. I based this entire character on my kid, on my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but I did think like uh, that. Philip is just like, I think one thing about him is like he's got like I think like if you could almost do it like in a joking, jokingly high expectations. Mm -hmm. Like so, everything is somewhat of a disappointment, and then make him very impatient, and then sprinkle a little old curmudgeonly man. Mm -hmm. And then a two-year-old. <laughs> I think that has a lot to do with it. Like, he's stubborn, and you can't win, and there is a... He's grumpy. I mm -hmm. think a little grumpy. And so, mm -hmm. um, but the key... I don't know. Like Alex said so many great... It was you know so great to be directed by him. He said something... He said every chance that Philip... If he's presented a, a choice between making the right decision and the wrong decision, he'll always make the wrong decision. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, like, you know, just getting into that frame of mind, like, just what's... What is the wrong thing to do in every situation? That's hmm. the path to go down with this hmm. character. Um, and uh, it was really like, and, and it's not like, I don't think it's human nature to do that. Like, it, there's, it's, that's anti survivalist sometimes. Like, you, sometimes it's your nature is to do the right thing, keep the thing, everything good. But, you know, other times your instinct is to go off the rails. Every man, you know. Yeah. Each man on his own, but um, I think that like talking to Alex, like I would say, like sometimes, like I don't know, like isn't he concerned about this? And Alex is like, no, hmm. he doesn't care about that. And no, he's thinking about that. And just like getting it lean, like that was the thing. Like 
I tend to like overthink things, or especially socially, like about you know, saying the wrong thing or what. And Alex is just like kept it lean, just like focus on these things, focus on these decisions, saying these types of things. And I think like that kind of, you know what I mean, that kind of thing is amazing. Mm -hmm. And also like just being able to talk to people like this was fun. And I describe it as like, you know, in my personal life, say like you're driving like an electric car, and then to play Philip was like <clears throat> getting to borrow a Ferrari for a couple of months. <laughs> And just being able to just like floor it. You, I mean, we're in New you York. know, I mean, just like rip into people. And it started to happen in like my normal life. Right. Yeah. When we were in New York, it says you like, you would like, we'd meet up later in the day and you'd be like, hey, you know, I was walking around this morning and like, I was just like thinking, like Philip thinking, and I was just like, God, these people are just everywhere. Oh, yeah. They're in my way. Like, I went to order something and it took them forever and I just wanted to like scream at them and tell them <laughs> I don't even want it anymore. Yeah. And you're like, it's really never my instincts to do that. But like, yeah. I read the script again this morning and I'm out getting a smoothie and I'm just like, just want to yell at them and be like, what's taking so long? Like, hmm. and, like I remember we were walking one time and we were just like walking on the street and I just saw someone in the corner and my instinct was to reach in my pocket and take out my keys and throw them at them. <laughs> and that's not like something I normally would do, but I think we spent, you know, every day before we even shot this, like a month almost together, just kind of like, basically meditating and marinating in these kinds of herbs, mm -hmm. you know, just this kind of like thing like that It's person, hard to divorce, yeah. Yeah. This person had a fanny pack or an absurd haircut. Both. <laughs> and there was just something so <laughs> obnoxious about what it was, it was, I don't know. Yeah. I do remember that really well, but I don't remember what the person Yeah, was. I just remember they were leaning against a wall in a way that drove me nuts. Oh no, it was like a guy wearing a halter top drinking a smoothie. Oh, maybe that's what it was. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's what it was. Yeah. yeah, he deserved to be taken out. Yeah. He deserved to be put to the ground. <laughs> Although I didn't do it. I, ten minutes later, I'm walking out with my own smoothie. <laughs> Mark, Come on. Walk, In walk, your walk, halter top? Walks out, walks out, this guy says, Hey, uh, Jason, huge fan. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so there's a lot of influences on display um, in the film. I think it feels, you know, there's Cassavetes, there's Woody Allen, there's Sidney Lumet. Just feels like those seven, those great kind of '70s with the palette, the flat camera, and the palette, and and the music and the narration. Um, who? Oh, it's okay. Do you use the bathroom? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and you just made the city come alive too. I mean, it feels like the Brooklyn that I where I live. You know, there's a lot to it. So. Who do you consider to be your greatest influences, and are those are those homages um, deliberate or conscious? Right. Well, my greatest influences would just be filmmakers who, throughout their career, are consistently excellent. I mean, mm -hmm. I could say who those are, and I would say something like Brian De Palma or Paul Schrader. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know if that's evident in this film, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but to me, it's like these, these are my biggest influences because they really never make a misstep, or very rarely make a misstep. Mm -hmm no matter what they're doing. Um, not to say someone could ever possibly make the argument that there's any De Palma in this film, but he is cinema to me and I'm never not thinking about him. But, you know, Paul Schrader is such a, a titan to me and I do feel like, you know, everything I, I've ever written is in some way part of the Paul Schrader world of the lonely individual, the, you know, the one person against everything and his themes, you know, everything he's ever written and directed or written for someone else basically is that and it's never failed to touch me deeply <clears throat> because he's just so he's just so good and he's just explored the same theme 30 times over the last several decades and he's just a king and um you know uh, but you know you can think about a hundred things when you've seen a lot of movies but for this you know you just have to get to the point where you're narrowing it down because if you want to be influenced by and talk about 50 movies you can't ask people to look at 50 movies you really need to know what you want you need to know what you're looking for mm -hmm. And, you know, Woody Allen, narratively, the milieu, yes, perhaps. What I really took away from him was the way that Husbands and Wives is shot. Mm -hmm. I mean, me and Sean, our cinematographer, put that movie on, don't, don't even need the volume. And uh, just the camera work in Husbands and Wives is from another universe of cinema mm -hmm. that 22 years later is still not something we've ever caught up with. It is from world beyond our comprehension and there is some magic happening in that film hmm. and you know forget about every all the themes of his movies and the comedy that alone mm -hmm. is what we were looking for now everything else of course is part of our fabric is you know people who live in a world with film because of course he's he's in the dna and right um it's unavoidable but that aspect of that film specifically could not have been more essential to this film and of course his new york of the 80s 
and early 90s New York. I just wanted that brown, dignified New York of people who read and no one's watching TV and no one's on their phones. And, um, you know, I just, I just fetishize it. And then, you know, we watched... This, uh, and there's that restaurant with the with the zebras. Is, Gina, is that Gina's or what's that restaurant? That is a bar in Park Slope oh, called really? the Fit Estate oh. that happens to have that wallpaper. Okay, because that's oh. from like Woody Allen movies back in the day. Like he used to use those. Yeah, I, I mean that's a coincidence. Okay, that's a restaurant. That's a, that's a bar that's three blocks from my house that my buddy knows the owner. We got to film there, and we were like, awesome. "Hey, there's that wallpaper." Awesome. And um, we watched Maurice Pilate, yeah. "We Won't Grow Old Together," which is a French film from 1972 about. Big influence. Yeah documentary filmmaker and the relationship it has with this woman and takes place over a simula- similarly nebulous period of time as listen to Philip. And just the movie has no relationship with chronological storytelling. Just, mm-hmm. There'll be a scene where people are screaming and grabbing each other by the lapels and then it's just cut in the middle of a fight and the next scene they're just walking on the beach holding hands. <laughs> and the way the narrative is yeah. examined in that film and the look at artistic strife between people who are trying to be in love is amazing <laughs> and it really blew my mind too like watching it because like um, I had never seen it and I loved like you know how Alex is just saying like so many movies you know you, there's one scene that we cut to other characters for a little bit and, but in this scene you, you have just a constant scene after scene of the same people fighting then happy happy then fighting fight. and but it's progressing but it's really it's really a small world and um Time moves in a way like he was just saying it's nebulous, and I feel the same. Like, you know, you watch Listen Up, Philip, and they're in a fight, and then the next day, Philip's walking down the street, and it could be like the next day, or it could be like two weeks later. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like that. Yeah, I think I'm the only one who could explain how much time passes in between scenes because I know, but it doesn't matter. Hmm. Yeah. Great. All right, well, cool. thank you so thank much, you, you so guys. Much. I appreciate it. It's it's really great. Nice. Thanks. Cool.